Uh, yep, it is recording. So it's the 21st of July, a little workshop on uh, paraphrasing, summarizing, reflection of feeling, all that sort of stuff. So I want to make it as practical as possible with just, just a couple of things to, to kick in, ladies. Um, you know, you tell me, what's, what's paraphrasing? For instance, what is it? Well, it's, it's oh, virtually, think... yeah, yeah. It's just, yeah, grabbing what they had yep. and saying it back to them, but in a shorter version so that they can understand and clarify it. Okay, that's that's 75% correct. But how does paraphrasing differ from reflection of feeling, for instance? Where Where's the, where's the subtle but very distinct difference? Uh, reflection of feeling isn't that to actually reflect the emotions that they're showing through it correct. rather than the action of the same. Yep. The way I learned it when I did my diploma and in, in my master's role, that we call it reflection of content. So reflection of content slash paraphrase is, you know, not parroting but feeding what the client has said back to him but purely on, on, a, on a content scale. So you know, just reiterating facts. Uh, reflection of feeling is, is more the emotion behind it. So you, you, you're feeding back the emotion. And there's a distinct difference between the two, the, the, the purpose of it. So would you know what the purpose is of a reflection of content versus a reflection of feeling, whether they differ? What's, what's the purpose of each? Well, I suppose they could sort of be saying one thing, mm -hmm. but then showing another. So if you're sort of touching on both, mm -hmm. you'll be able to get an idea of what's sort of behind why they're there. But look back at the micro skills. You're nearly there, though, Deb. But maybe you know, Dale can jump in as well. There's, there's, a, there's a subtle difference between the purpose of paraphrasing and the purpose of reflection of feeling. So what, as counsellors, are we trying to convey with you know, a paraphrase and what are we trying to convey with a reflection of feeling? There's a, there's a subtle but very distinct difference. Well, in both, really, we just, we're just... Um I mean, to show them that we are listening and that we are understanding what they're saying and feeling. Now you've covered them both. So purely technically, if you look at it from an academic point of view, a paraphrase is to show the fact that we're actually listening, you know, the understanding that we are there with the client and we are listening to what they are saying. So that attentive listening skill, purely that, you know, academically. Reflection of feeling is to show empathy. So we're not only there with them, but we're actually showing that empathy that we actually feel with them. We don't feel for them, but we feel with them. You know, so keep that in mind. It, it's, it's, it's minor. It's yeah. an academic difference. But you know, the, the reflection of content is more, uh, yep, I'm here with you. I'm hearing you. you know, I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying kind of thing. The, the reflection of feeling is more, uh, yep, okay, that must really hurt. So you know, feeding back the emotion or at least you know, the empathy that you're is the empathetic listening. So paraphrases yeah. the attentive listening the reflection of feeling is the empathetic listening so there's, there's a slight difference between that and yeah. okay from those two if you look at a summary what's what's a summary just summarizing all their content what they've said pretty much so that, yeah. yeah basically saying you know i've got that right yeah so you a know, summary yeah. is is more a it's it's a bigger version of a reflection of content and a reflection of feeling put together that's really it. So you're taking the most poignant point, points of what the client has said at the end usually, or sometimes there's a natural pause halfway the session. Sometimes there is an opportunity to just do a, you know, a summary halfway so to make sure you get it all correctly and then move on. So summaries, you don't have to do too many, you know, maybe one or two. Uh, that's about it, um, oh, depending on the length of the session and then what's been discussed, obviously. Uh, reflection of content and reflection of feeling. I know I'm hammering you both, but pretty much every student, we can always do no, more of those. <laughs> always do more of those. Yeah, it's ev pretty much every sentence is is a good reason to put a reflection of content or reflection of feeling in, uh, unless it becomes completely robotic and it starts to sound you know, inauthentic. But it's you, know, you can pretty much do a good session, a really good counselling session on only reflections of content and reflections of feelings, of you know, paraphrases and reflection of feelings. Because ultimately, from a Rogerian perspective, you know, if you do that, the client will find their own answers. They, they obviously will, they, they often will keep talking. You know, they just keep talking about what it is that they do. Not always. You get the, you know, the quiet ones that don't say much. But generally, once you help people just stay in the flow of their conversation and help them open up more, by you reflecting feelings and content, they, you know, they constantly affirm that what you said is actually true. And then they'll add to it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's 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 a really funny process once you start to work with it. I used to be really bad at it. It's I was a, you know, a bit like I've probably you know sort of accused you both a little bit of you know the mentoring consulting type, and I still do that. 
Uh, it's it's very easy, and it's uh, are you Kylie <laughs> jumping on? Hi, sorry, inhaling food. Yeah, go for it. I'll just keep talking. I'll ignore you. That's fine. It's, yeah. uh, so the whole idea with that, you know, I, I used to do that as well, and it's so easy because you know sometimes you think you know we want to save people and help them, but just keeping that silence, you know, it's it's often way more powerful to just you know drop back what they've just told you and then stay still, you know, and just don't say anything. It's it's super powerful. And now that I'm practicing it more and more myself, even it's actually, uh, you, know, you can sort of start seeing the effects of it. It's pretty cool. Um, I was just going to say, uh, sorry, I was just yep. going to say, but that's like, that's like PCT. It's, is it's, that pure, it's pure PCT. Pure PCT. Yeah, it's yeah. micro skills. You know, it's, it's the Rogerian skills put in practice, really. It's, it's just mm. that. And I know I've, keep, uh, I've kept mentioning that one in, in uh, the practicals as well. Have you ever watched those Gloria videos of Carl Rogers? Yeah, yeah. Man, the guy's an absolute genius and not saying anything, you know, he's, but, but still doing a really good session. You know, it's, it's just fascinating stuff. I remember from watching the, the Gloria videos, there was, there was three. You know, one was with uh, Carl Rogers. The other one was Fritz Perls, the Gestalt guy. And the yep. third one was with, what's with, ah, geez, the, the CBT fella. Uh, oh, not CBT. Ah, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. And uh, afterwards, it was actually an interview with, with Gloria, whatever her name was. And uh, she found that Carl Rogers was the nicest guy. She really felt mm. most respected by Carl Rogers, as in she was able to do her story and, and therefore felt really heard by him. But didn't see, didn't feel much therapeutic value, as in, you know, we didn't really do much. Um, Fritz Perls, you know, the, the Gestalt guy was uh, a bit of a bastard. She thought she didn't say them that many words, but he was yeah. a bit rough. And mm. it's not Aaron Beck, the other one. Oh, gosh. Uh, not Aaron Beck. What's the other one? Can't think of it. Yeah, I've, I've watched him. I can't think of his name nah. either. Ah, uh, it doesn't matter. It's uh, the, the rationally motive one, uh, whatever his name is. <laughs> doesn't matter but she thought that was most useful sort of cbt ish type stuff she thought that was most useful to to think through her thinking so you know there's value in, in applying all of them and that's why we're trying to teach a bit of a you know, an eclectic sort of you know what do you call it uh enmeshed version of it with everything in there but as a, as a good foundation to be liked and, and to have value as a counselor you must must get those rogerian skills under your belt they and i was talking to a shanine you know other student this morning and I said, you must make that part of your toolbox. You know, the, the skills of paraphrasing, summarizing, and reflection of feeling are like a hammer to a carpenter. You know, it's, it's a must-have tool. You know, you can't do your job properly unless you start to work on those skills. And do you have to master them now? No. But do you have to keep working on them? Yes. You know, that's the whole idea. Just keep working with them. So what I want to do, and I'm, I'm using this book. Good book. You got it. It should be in your, uh, yeah, you got that? Okay, cool. And I think chapters five to 10 pretty much uh, delve with it. So you don't have to flick it open because I'll use it now. But I'll uh, pretty much just want to put a couple of examples out there and uh, I'll, I'll just go around the room, really. So I'll start off with you, Dale, because you have volunteered. You don't know that, <laughs> but, you, but you have. So purely a reflection of content, you know, purely feeding back to me what I've just said, but then in, in a way that's not a parroting type exercise, but I don't want you to repeat me, but just put it back as in a, in a reflection. So uh, here's the sentence, yeah. Yesterday I rushed around and I seemed to have no time to myself. I went from one place to another and it was really hard to fit everything in, Dale. Now, how could so you paraphrase that back to me? So it was a pretty hectic day for you yesterday. Brilliant, yeah. You had a very full on day. Yeah, great, great reflection. Yeah, it's it's a simple one, but it's powerful. It's just that's just that. Now that won't make you a brilliant counselor, but it's it's definitely <laughs> part of your your skill set. You know, you're hammering a nail in. Um, here's another one for you, Debbie. Um, I'm fighting with my son. My husband's not speaking to me. At work, the boss keeps picking on me, and what's more, my best friend doesn't seem to understand me anymore. Deb. Okay, so. You're actually feeling as though everything's against you at the moment. Uh, 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 no feeling. Reflection of content. Paraphrase. So we would cut that out and just say you're feeling very stressed about everything. No feeling yet. No feeling yet. So. No feeling. So I'm fighting with my son. My husband's not speaking to me. And my boss keeps picking on me. And my best friend doesn't understand me anymore. Reflection of content. You're stressed in your life at the moment then. 
getting better. I still wouldn't mean it's mention like stress. Yeah, you yeah. you got a lot of stuff going on, or yeah. you seem to have you seem to have a lot of relationship problems. Yeah, you know, ah, purely thanks. reflecting back the content, not the feeling yet. Now we'll combine them, but this is where we sort of rip them Can't apart. You know. Sorry. Can't sit there and do that. Oh yeah, I can absolutely. <laughs> Watch me and just slap you. All right, here's another one for you, Kylie. Okay, my daughter's a very attractive girl. She's good looking and vivacious. She dresses very nicely and she's a good natured person. She often smiles and seems to be very happy. Reflection of content, please. Your daughter sounds fantastic. Yeah, good work. Yeah, the, the example that they give here is your daughter has many positive qualities. Works a treat. Yeah, and, and what you'll read in both Ivy and Ivy and Geldart and Geldart is that there's no really right and wrong one as long as you follow. You know, that's, it's not that this one is better uh, or than another one that you come up with as long as you reflect the reflect content. So, it just feels, a lot of it yeah. feels really forced. Yep, it is. I feel like it's, we're unnecessarily reflecting almost every single paragraph that the client is saying and it yep. doesn't feel natural at all. Nope. Nope, it's the samurai effect. Remember that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's doing it until you master it to the point that you start using them, but not misusing or abusing them. You know, it's it's you don't have to do it with every sentence. It's that's not necessary. But in order to get that, and that you miss that little bit, but to get you know the, the reflection of uh, content, so the the paraphrase is to build the understanding, or or build the the feeling in the client that you're actually understanding and that you're listening to them. So as part of the Rogerian skills, it's a, it's a massively important one. You know, just have to do it every now and then because it builds that therapeutic rapport, that therapeutic alliance quite quickly. And research shows it does, you know, and it's it, it works. You know, so yes, does it feel forced? Absolutely. For me, it still feels very forced because it's not something I would naturally do. Uh, but when I do it, I see the positive response. So it's like, okay, might as well use it now because it, it seems to work. So. And, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm ripping them apart now. So generally you'll do both of them and we'll get there, you know, where you put in a reflection of content and a reflection of feeling in one sentence. But I just want you to get that whole idea is like, you know, wax on, wax off. Uh, just do that before you become a samurai fighter. So, um, okay, here's another one. It's a bit longer. I'll, I'll pass that one back to you, Dale. I spent all Saturday cleaning up my grandmother's yard, but she was annoyed because she said I'd cut her shrubs too short. I over pruned them. Then I went to a great deal of trouble repainting the back door. Once again, she complained. This time the color was too bright. And finally, at the end of the day, I suggested that I take, out, take her out to dinner to save her cooking like she usually does. I thought that was sure to please her. But would you believe it? When she got to the restaurant, she complained that she'd never liked that food at that restaurant. I keep trying to do things that will please her. But whatever I do, she never seems to be happy. Dale. It was grandmother, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah grandma. Um, doesn't Absolutely. seem like grandma was having a very good day. Yeah, that could be one. No, it's, I'll probably make it a bit more personal or something like, it just seems you can't please your grandmother. Or it seems mm. to me that you just can't please your grandmother or it seems very hard to please your grandmother or whatever. Or, you know, whatever you do, nothing seems to please her. Is that correct? Yeah, and then okay. you're done, yeah. So that's, that's uh, lots and, you know, read, if you want to read Geldart, Geldart, page 51 and onwards, you know, chapter six, that's, that's where that's all uh, in there. And there's actually quite a good example uh, on page 54 and 55 of a counseling session where the counselor does nothing but reflect back. <laughs> and it's, and it's actually quite a nice, quite a nice little counseling session. It works. All right. So reflections of feeling. You know? So keep in mind, reflection of feeling used to build empathy. You know, so the empathetic response is as opposed to the reflection of content, which is used to build understanding and, and attentive listening. Um, anything that I want to do? Ah, yeah. What what do most people uh, or and even counsellors have problems with when it comes to counselling sessions? This is like pretty much kicking the goal now. But what is, what is a tough topic for most counsellors and most people to talk about? Yeah. Yeah, my emotions in general, hey, it's like, uh, I know I'm prone to that one. Uh, if someone really gets emotional in my therapy room, there's a tendency to quickly start applying CBT to that because then at least you don't have to talk about the emotions anymore. You know, you can, well, what's the thought behind that? And we can skip that whole emotional hoo-ha bit. You know, I don't want to go there, which is, you know, it's something I still have to work with. 
in the, this model learning curve. But it's, it's a really easy one because most people, first of all, most people want to avoid feelings, even the client. They said, ah, oh, yeah, you know what? Yeah, that might be really unhappy, but, and then they'll start talking about something else. You know, so they avoid it, which actually, once you start to get into counseling, getting in touch with that feeling and, and going through that cathartic experience of actually experiencing it, because that's usually the big, you know, the big problem, is very often the key to the solution. You know? So your job as a professional communicator as a counselor is actually to get people back in touch with those feelings, even though you might not like it. And, and even though, yeah, it might create some awkward moments in your therapy room where you have to get out the box of tissues or even you might start to well up a little bit because it's like, oh, it touches you as well. It's a very good thing to, to help clients move through it because as long as those emotions stay unexpressed, yeah, you can CBT it until the nth degree, but they'll you know, stay stuck in that emotion anyway because they haven't touched it. You know, they've just thought about it. So big difference between thoughts and feelings, obviously. So when you look at um, paraphrases and reflections of feeling, how you describe them, what would be, what would be a difference? Don't look at Gellar and Gellar because you can find a difference. So how would you describe an event versus a feeling? What's, what's a major difference in description between the two? Maybe it's a cryptic question and I'll tell it, but give it a shot. So what would be the difference between actually describing content and describing feelings in, in terms of length of description? I would, well, an event is just, ha oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Dale. Um, I would suggest that describing feelings could become quite lengthy. The other way around, generally. Well, that's oh, that's yeah. at least the academic thing, yeah. When, when you're looking back at uh, how do you do paraphrases and summaries and, and reflections of feeling, reflections of feeling often come back to one word. You know, you're feeling sad or sounds like you're really angry or that makes you feel really frustrated, didn't it? You know, so whereas a reflection of content, you know, allows you to sort of you know, paraphrase back what the client has said. Often feelings are expressed in one word you know, and that's something where we as counselors go wrong uh, wrong is not the right word but where we make mistakes as well where clients often put thoughts into feeling sentences so they might say it's like oh you know I'm, i feel sure that we learn best by practical experience well is that really a feeling or is that a thought I would say if you say something like, I feel that we learn best by doing things practically rather than academically. Well, is that really a feeling that you've just expressed or are you just expressing a thought or opinion? Well, I would say you're expressing a thought. You know, so mm -hmm. you say, I, real, I feel really devastated. No, that's a feeling. You know, it's, just, it's just a one worder. Now, obviously, you can describe feelings in a few more, more words than one, but generally as, as a ballpark, uh, you'll find clients describing feelings in, in one word. And that's where you can do a reflection of feeling on. You know, so if I would say something like clients, like I feel that it's, it's right to do this, this or this, you know, that or that way, you as a counselor wouldn't have to apply a reflection of feeling on that one because that's actually not a feeling. You know? But if you say, look, I feel really uh, angry at the fact that you know, no one teaches me to do things practically. No, that's where you can apply a reflection of feeling on. It's like, ah, oh, so you feel angry, don't you? So, hey, hey, I'm really angry. So, okay, cool. You know, so they either use the word or maybe they describe it, but it has to have a, a feeling element behind it, not just a thought element. You know? So be careful with that one. There's a bit written on that one as well. As I know, I had quite a bit of trouble with that one, sort of distinguishing, you know, because I'm a, I'm a kinesthetic type guy, so I often talk in terms of feeling. You know, I, I feel this, that, or the other which is actually not necessarily feeling. It's just the way I express my thoughts. You know, so you've got to be, be careful with that one, especially with the, with the kinesthetic people. So um, you know, page 64, 65, a lot of one word feeling words. They're actually pretty cool. All right. Yeah, go um, ahead. I was just wondering when would the phrase then, I believe, would that ever come into counseling? Yeah, well, yeah um, often. Yep. What about it? Well, I'm just, just thinking, because like you said, like you said about feelings and stuff. So mm -hmm. I believe then what's that? That is a feeling. That That's a, a feeling. Is that you I believe? believe? Is, that a, is that a feeling? Well, when I, well, when I say that I believe that the earth is round, is that a feeling? 
Oh, it's a thought then. Yeah. yeah it's more a thought. It's what, what is a belief anyway? Ah, that's it. There's another workshop for you, Dell. Thanks for that. We'll, uh, we'll put another workshop <laughs> on that one. <laughs> but what, what's a belief? A belief. Real, yeah. Let's do a one minute workshop on beliefs. What's a belief? Something you feel. No, Something. no, 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 no. What's a belief? No. Well, a belief can be something that actually expresses itself in a feeling. I mean, you might feel very convinced about that, but even convinced is not a feeling. You might feel strong about that. You might feel really motivated by that. Even that's not a feeling. But what, what is a belief? What is a belief? What is it? I think it can be different things to different cultures, and it can then be complicated by certain religious doctrine. Yep. Okay. But what, what generally from a neuroscientific or neuropsychological point of view, what is a belief? What is a belief? Education through experience. Yeah. Okay. But what is it? What, what is it in here? I'll give you that one. You know, at least in my opinion, that's how I learned it. So a belief is an idea, initially an idea that has so many pieces of evidence to it that ultimately it starts solidifying itself as a, as a truth, as something that's true for you. you know, so it's a thought, initially a thought, like, oh, I believe uh, I'm actually quite a likable person or I believe that people are actually okay. You know? Now, it might not be something that you believe yet, but it could be an idea that you're forming about yourself or, or whatever. You know? So the only way that, that an idea becomes a belief is if pieces of evidence actually start adding up to that initial idea so it solidifies itself into something you say, yeah, that's actually quite true. You know, it's, you're, you're talking about individual subjectivity. Yep. Yeah. Because well, what is a belief? Isn't it anything else? It could be collective, but it, it's, you know, because we agree on that belief, but isn't a belief something I believe? So what is it? What is it otherwise? You know, if we have matching beliefs, then we might hook up and, and form a group about that. Yeah, but isn't the belief an individual idea that has enough evidence for, for you to say that's true? Mm. Yeah, and, and if that belief becomes even stronger, then it becomes a conviction. And now you can't ever, ever convince me that it's not right anymore because it's just, it's just the way it is, Kylie. Yeah, there's just no doubt about that. Yeah, but nah, it doesn't matter. You know, this is how it is. So a lot of people with, with similar beliefs come together, form groups and have a great old time. You know, and, and a lot of people with opposing beliefs start wars, <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, it's an idea that has just you know, built, whether it's, you know, look at developmental psychology through, you know, what your, what your parents have taught you and what your peers have taught you, what your professors have taught you and what your professionals have taught you. It's like, well, that must be true. Yeah. And, and in CBT, we look at those beliefs and say, well, really, is, is that really the case? You know, I believe that I'm, I'm no good because everything I do seems to fall to pieces. You know, and no one likes me. No, those are expressions of beliefs, you know, in a sense. Because if you ask that person, well, where did you get that evidence from? It's like, well, this, that, the other, you know, there, 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 there. So, right, okay, yeah, well, if you believe all that and, and have the, all that evidence, then sure, yeah, I can understand why you feel that way. But the whole idea about CBT is to break down those beliefs, you know, at least put put a couple of sticks of dynamite underneath the foundations of it you know, and see if we can crack it up a bit. But that's again, another workshop. I'll do another workshop on that. But, so a belief, Dale, just to, to answer it really quickly and, and probably without all the nuances, a belief is just an idea that has had enough evidence to confirm that idea that you now say, well, it's true, you know, because I've seen it at least 10 times. So therefore it must be true. You know, yeah. until I prove, until I prove 20 times the opposite and you go, like, oh, okay, well, maybe you are right then. Well, maybe I am until someone proves 30 times the other way or something different again. So a belief is not necessarily feeling, you know, a belief can lead to a feeling because I can feel really powerful. I can really feel really, you know, comforted in the idea that what I think is true. I can feel a lot of support in that. You know, I can feel, you know, certain I can feel well, whatever it is that I'm looking for safe, you know, in the belief that there is a higher power that you know, supports me in, in everything I do. So it can definitely lead to a feeling, but a belief is more a neurological process. It's, you know, it's like, well, a couple of thoughts with, with some evidence to it. So in the old neurolinguistics, you know, neurolinguistic programming ideas, like you can really believe anything, 
as long as you find enough evidence to support your idea, you'll start believing it. <laughs> Trust me. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> so reflection of feeling, ladies. Um, purely a reflection of feeling. I'll start with you again, Dale, because you're up top um, in my mm -hmm. screen anyway. I keep expecting my mother to show more interest in me. Time and time again, I've asked her to come over and see me, but she never does. Yesterday was my birthday and she did come to visit me. But do you know, she didn't even remember it was my birthday. I don't, I just think she doesn't care about me at all. They'll reflect my feeling, please. Okay. Um, so um, your, feel, your feeling is though um, you're not import, important to your mum at the moment because you didn't remember your birthday and you're feeling a little bit left out. Yeah, it's a slightly longer version, but yeah, it could be, ah, oh, so you feel disappointed or you feel hurt. No, like, yeah, 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 I feel really hurt, you know, because this, that and the other and then my story will probably continue on. Yes, uh, okay, another one for you, Deb. Uh, first of all, my brother broke my electric drill. He didn't bother to tell me that he'd broken it. He just left it lying there. Then what do you think he did? He borrowed my motorbike without asking me. I feel like thumping him, Deb. You feel angry that your brother's touching all your things. So you're furious. Oh, yeah, 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 I'm furious, man. So, and that's often what you'll get. You know, if you get it correct, you'll often get something like, yeah, absolutely. And then you know you've, you've got it right. You, you hit the nail on the head. Now, something that they write in these books as well, it doesn't really matter if you get it wrong. You know, so don't feel you have to get it right because that opens up more discussion. So if, if someone says something, you say, oh, you see, you feel really frustrated and the client will go like, no, I'm not frustrated. I'm just really angry. He said, oh, okay, so you're angry. He said, yeah, right, okay. So where's the difference between feeling frustrated and angry then? You can open up a discussion about that one. So it's, it's you know, the empathetic check, see if I got it right. And you can preface, you preface it like that or preface it. And you say, well, let me see if, they, if, if I get this right. So you're frustrated? You say, well, no, frustration is not the right word. I'm, I'm angry or whatever it is. You know, so don't, don't fear getting it wrong either, but try and get as close as possible. It just opens up discussion, which is always good. Did you notice a pattern of feeling over one session or a number of sessions? Wouldn't you then feel as though as a counsellor, you need to delve more into that feeling that the client is experiencing? What was triggering it? Absolutely. Yep. And that would be uh, the, the subsequent, uh, the subsequent, meeting or whatever yeah you can pick them up on that one yeah absolutely yeah if you see a if you see a tendency to sort of repeat a certain feeling you know, constantly frustrated or constantly anxious or whatever it is or constantly sad yeah sure then, then there's a there may be psychodynamic stuff behind it that you can start exploring for sure yeah so that's why it's so good to do reflections of feeling because even though you might pick up on them it's good to get that empathetic response back and say, yeah, yeah, that seems to be, that seems to be a thread in my life, doesn't it, Kylie? And go, mm -hmm. just noticing, yeah. And then it's something you can start talking about later on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good point. I am, uh, I'm looking at the clock as well. I've got 10 more recorded minutes and otherwise we'll get cut off, but I'll, I'll give you one. So the third version of that one, and summaries we'll do another time, but this is basically just combining the two. And that's, that's what real life is probably more about, you know? So paraphrases plus reflections of feeling in one big hit, which is way more real than doing just one and then doing the other. You might, but it, it generally doesn't help me. So for instance, uh, your one for you, Kylie, I got a new job recently. It's quite different from the old one. The boss is nice to me and I've got a good office to work in and the whole atmosphere in the firm is really positive. I can't believe I'm so lucky. Now give me both. So you're feeling excited and happy about the new job that you've got. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Or something short in my version would be, so, and you've got a new job and you feel great. How good's that? And go, like, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, now you've reflected both. Um, we'll do another one. Okay, uh, up top again, Dale. Uh, young people nowadays aren't dressed smartly like they used to be in my day. They're dirty, they're rude, and they don't stand and stand up for you in buses. I don't know what's become of the new generation. Now, paraphrase and reflection of feeling, Dale. Um. um well, I was kind of. Um, so <laughs> you're disillusioned with how the young people are today, and because of how they are, that um, peeves you off. Yeah, you 
a bit long, but yeah, pretty good. Yeah, so you feel disgusted by the new generation. Is that correct? Like, yeah, yeah, because or you feel disgusted by them, or you don't feel that they're doing the right thing anymore, or you feel disappointed because they don't show you the, the traditional courtesy anymore. It's like, yeah, that's about correct. Cool. Or if they go like, no, nah, that's not really it. Great. Now again, you've got an you know, you've got an opening to a further discussion. So again, getting it wrong is no big deal. Uh, Deb, one for you. Uh, okay, I'll turn this one around. My girlfriend just rang me from this hotel overseas. She's a reporter and is in a real trouble spot. When I was talking to her over the phone, I could hear angry voices in the background, and then there was a terrible crash and the line went dead. And I don't know what's happened to her. You worried about your girlfriend overseas? Yeah. Or yeah. Okay. So you worried about what might have happened to your girlfriend overseas? Yeah, so it's a reflection of content as well. So not only the, the uh, sure, I'm worried about my girlfriend, but if you want to make it slightly longer because you're putting the content in there too, it's like, oh, so you're worried about what might have happened to your girlfriend or you're worried about in, in what pickle your girlfriend has got herself in or uh, you're worried about the situation your girlfriend in. Is that correct? Yeah. So that's that's a good one. So I think you got that sussed. Now, there are ways you can preface it, you know, so... Often uh, the one I use is let me see if I get this correct. Yeah, that's that's a good one to sometimes summarise it, but also in a reflection of content you can use that one. Uh, what I've heard you say is, uh, it seems to me that uh, I'm getting the idea that, uh, and one I found in Ivy and Ivy actually, which deals with this in well, somewhere chapter seven way. Yeah, it sounds like I sense that. Or it comes across to me that, uh, yeah, and then you pretty much fill it in. Yeah, so those are the reflections of content, reflection of feeling. Now summaries are just longer version of both, and that's that's really as easy as I can summarize it for you. Um, Geldard and Geldard uses, I think it's chapter ten. Yeah, chapter ten deals with summarizing. So get that one there as well. Uh, Ivy and Ivy do as well. I don't know which which chapter it is, but it's somewhere along those lines. So once you use that, I think your your you know, your assignment, should you choose to accept it, uh, would be <laughs> to start using every session. And yes, mechanically, Kylie, uh, start putting them in. Yeah, wax on, wax off. It's like it's annoying. Yeah, but it's it works a treat. And yes, it will feel completely fake, and it'll feel robotic, and it will feel like a, a completely messed up counselling session. But observe the response in your client and, and get out of your own head with that one. That's not talking to you only, Kylie, but in general, for me too, just get out of the, your own head of wanting to do things a certain way and thinking that one way is a natural way or thinking it has to be natural or whatever. Just do it. Just focus. You know, just pick up that hammer, pick up that nail and really consciously start hammering it in without just doing it because you know what you're doing. You don't even have to look at it. You know, it's... it's Sorry, yeah. we've summarize if you've got a stock standard hour session from what i've experienced those hour sessions tend to go for about 50 minutes yeah at what point during that session do you start summarizing the entire session with a view to ending are you looking at around the 40 minute mark the 45 45, minute? 45 yeah i try and, and do my contents like my my intro spiel is fairly short so if it's a first session i do my quick intro spiel which i'll do in that session with michelle that i'll do next week uh, but it's it's pretty quick so we can get straight into the content and i try and time myself that we we talk content for about 45 minutes and then I'll summarize what we discussed. And then the last 10 minutes or so are based on homework, assignment tasks, feedback as well, you know, the client informed uh, approach. So what did you think of the session? What do you think about how we're doing together? You know, are we still a good match? Is there something I have to do differently? You know, whatever. So, you know, the last five minutes are on, on client informed feedback and, and give me a bit of feedback on, you know, what you've learned in this session and whether we are still a good match. And, the five minutes before is maybe homework tasks and then five minutes for whatever miscellaneous, but yeah, about 45 minutes uh, of, of actual session time and the rest is wrap up really. Yeah. That's, that's sort of my, and, and sometimes am I always sticking to that one? I, uh, I'm, I'm accused by my partner to go over session time too often, which is true. 
because sometimes you get wrapped up in a discussion. You go, like, I can't stop this one. You know, it's like, eh, there's too much good content. And then there's just bad luck. I just, I go 10 minutes over, but uh, I try not to. Uh, I try and keep an eye on my clock and go like, okay, yeah, but it's 3.37 in the afternoon. We only got until about, you know, 10 to 4. Oh, I need to start wrapping up. And that's uh, you're the timekeeper. So that's that's up to you. You know, your client never is the timekeeper. It's up to you to sort of keep track of time as well. So about 45. And what about yeah. cutting sessions short? Not a good idea. Uh, if you have to, apologize profusely <laughs> and say, look, we, we will definitely pick up on where we left off next time. You know, as, uh, as I feel or I sense or I'm of the opinion that we've left a lot of things untouched that I really, I really want to touch on and I think you would like to touch on as well. Is that correct? And then yeah, if you have to, well, you have to. But I, I try not to. Um, so that's, there's a defined balance between timekeeping and, and not wanting to sort of disrespect you know, a session flow as well, uh, which is tough. Sometimes it's tough, yeah. Okay. Make sense? Yep. Yep, cool. That's all you're going to get on the 40-minute thing unless I pay a, a pay a fee for my Zoom, which I'm not. So we'll <laughs> pra practice with it. Hey, I want to see that in, in all three of your pracs. Uh, I want to see forced. <laughs> That helps. <laughs> forced, forced reflections of feelings and content and read Geldart and Geldart, mainly Geldart and Geldart because he explained, they explain it quite easily. Ivy and Ivy is a cool book. It's, it's a bit like, uh, like a tough yeah. chew. You know, where if, yeah. if you use Geldart and Geldart, it's, it's pretty easily digestible. So use that one mainly for that one. And then uh, next time we'll, we'll, we'll keep on. I'll, I'll do another session on this, maybe on a bit more uh, of putting everything in. Okay. Okay. All righty. And behind you. Which one? That one? The book. Yeah. That's not a book. That's just uh, the ACA counseling journal. If you're oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, ACA membership. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah. Ciao. See you next time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.